Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today are life coaches Cindy Chavez and Jackie Gates. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And I'm especially glad to be inside on a very cold day here in the Northeast. I imagine, Jackie, you've got something similar going on in Minnesota. It's just, it's raw. It's that kind of a raw day where, no, thank you. Minnesota, yeah, we're at 48 degrees. So it's oh my God, and sun shining. It's kind of toasty by comparison. So, by comparison? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what is it for you, Walt? Um, I think we actually did reach the 40s today, but it, it, it's that humid kind of cold. The dry cold is one thing. Dry cold just is cold. Humid cold is like, oh, it feels like. It's all damp. Yeah. Yeah. Like bone chilling. Yeah. Yeah. It's when the wind is cold. We walked to the grocery store the other day and the wind goes straight through everything you're wearing down to your bone marrow. It's just like, oh. So, and that's my, that's when I get grumpy, like within three steps and I'm cross. I'm like, are you sure we can't starve? Do we have to? <laughs> Do you want to know? Oh, know? Now I'm halfway there. Yeah, I know. And it's just, and it's really, I mean, it's, yeah, I can see the store from my balcony. So it's not that far, but it's far enough when it's cold like that. So. It's, well, at some point you ask yourself, is food really a necessity? Yes, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. I did, I did buy myself a, because now I'm invested in being here. I'm not, it's so interesting when you, when you stop resisting where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm, right. And so the last time we were up in Minnesota, I had in my head, it was temporary. I was just here to welcome the grandbabies and then I was going back south where it's warm. And so consequently, I did two winters with not a good enough coat. And a lot of the things that I could have invested in because I'm not staying. Hello. Which, which worked really well when I actually was going to move. But then when, you know, it, it made for a miserable winter. And, um, and so now this time it's like, okay, we're going to choose to be here because this is where the grandbabies are and we'll jet off and do the snowbird thing maybe in February. But in the meantime, we're going to need a new coat. So I bought one. That is those poofy things. So I look rather like the Pillsbury Doughman, only like <laughs> with blonde hair. And, but I don't care. I, well, I'm, I feel glamorous enough, sort of in a snow bunny, sort of poofy way, but mm-hmm. it is, it, it has made the world of difference. Now I just oh, complain yeah. that my mascara freezes and my, my lip glosses. <laughs> <laughs> but but it has made the world a difference, and it's so interesting because it was that thought that allowed me to invest in where I am, and consequently made where I am less necessary to resist, which was a very interesting thing because last time I resisted being here, so I didn't invest in anything that made it easier to be here, and I did leave, mm. so in that way it was successful, but this time... Um, I'm going to, I'm noticing the, that the tenor of my days is less <laughs> grumpy for want of a better word. Um, I'm not resisting the weather because I'm invested in making it work, being here. So it's an interesting, you know, your thoughts, thoughts can't change the weather, but they can sure as hell change how you feel about it. Yeah. I like that whole train of thought because you know resistance always makes everything harder but this is like you're explaining you know when you can really look back and realize how that worked it's like Mm -hmm. you were resisting being there and I, i have a similar thing that uh in the weather thing here i it's 75 degrees today ah stop it and you know we get like two weeks of winter if we get winter and it's yeah. always like, oh, I start looking at coats and I'm like, I don't want to spend $300 on a coat. No. In 10 it's days, it'll be it. 70 degrees again. So I never do it. So consequently, every winter I go through that instead of just making the decision. I'm, <laughs> I'm not trying to leave. So, but yeah, that's, that's really interesting how that. And it's, and it's so interesting because I do this when I coach clients who are, um, who, who come to me and say, I don't feel at home where I am. And invariably, 
it's because, for example, they're, they're in a rental and they feel temporary or they know they're not going to stay. So they don't invest any time or energy. Those two being the key, because you don't actually have to spend any money if you don't want to, but, um, time and energy in making it feel like home because they've decided it can't. Yeah. And so I had decided I cannot be happy in cold weather. And I'm slowly but surely untangling that because, yeah, the, the, the general happiness quotient of my days requires me to untangle that. I can, you know, I, I do not want to be in a foul mood from September through March, actually in Minneapolis through April, because we get snow in April. Anyhow, don't get me started. Um, but it is this... <laughs> It is this decision about how you are going to show up for the in, immovables of your life, mm-hmm. right? Um, and part of, we had this discussion, Walt, with, um, you know, when we deal with a catastrophe, when we deal with some kind of weather thing, weather being a big deal um, and, and not easily changed by thoughts, um, but Housing is another thing. We have circumstances, things that happen. Life happens. And you can end up in a place where you aren't 100% happy. You wish you weren't, you know, I would love to have um, a separate office, for example. Um, But in the meantime, I'm loving the space I have because I know that loving the space I have will lead me to more space to love. So Mm -hmm. this is this is where, you know, it, it is. We have to claim our power, but we also have to claim where we are most powerful. I can resist the cold weather all I like, and winter in Minnesota is still going to be ridiculous. Um, and Or I can decide that I'm going to look fabulous in my poofy coat <laughs> and set myself up accordingly, right? Uh, waterproof mascara and eyelashes that don't freeze together, things like that. So it is, it is this idea that, um, our thoughts are, you don't always have to change the circumstance. You can just change what you think about it. Yeah. Cause most often, you know, or, or much of the time you can't change the circumstance, especially the ones that are really bothering you. That's why they bother us because we don't think that we can change them. And yet changing how we feel about them and think about them. That's often the thing that causes the shift where the circumstance can change, right? Right, exactly, because what we resist persists. And if we keep resisting it, well, let's put it this way. I don't think we're going to hit 70 degrees in December in Minnesota anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But I can still feel fabulous and not be grumpy and all those things. So, um, And then how... Who's to say that I don't suddenly win the lottery and get a chance to be a snowbird for three months of a year instead of one month, right? I mean, these are the, these are the random ways that what we want show up. But when we're so busy resisting what is, we don't give those opportunities a chance to show up. Yeah, that's really true. Although I have to admit, I'm still sitting here. I'm kind of imagining frozen mascara. I hadn't considered that one before. Well, to be honest, Walt, dear, I don't think it's anything that's in your current reality that you need to worry about. No, no. <laughs> but, you know, there is, I mean, we've had, not that you wear mascara every day, um, but it is that it is, it is, we were here three, four years ago when we had the polar vortex and we had three days of minus 50, 50, um, wind chills and you stepped outside and the first breath you took in, all your nose hairs freeze and your tear ducts freeze. Um, and, oh. and so any moisture will freeze. And it makes you know, sense. Yeah. yeah. And then you get, you know, it's, and they will, Minnesota is really good about that. I'm sure a lot of the, the other northern states are where they will warn you and say three minutes and you will have frostbite. Two minutes, frostbite. Don't go outside. You know, it is this, when we had that, they canceled all deliveries. They canceled everybody that didn't need to be outside except for. That's amazing. Time. That's such a short period of time. Mm-hmm. I remember you were talking to me during this. We were talking on the phone and you were by your balcony door. Yes. And you were like, you opened it for like one second. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah, because I was doing offerings to the spirits of place. And, and it was like, <laughs> I opened the door and I shoved the incense out and I closed it. And I said, you guys have to understand. 
<laughs> that's the first time I realized when you were like, no, because they're, they're making warnings that you can't even go out for like 30 seconds and you'll be in trouble. And I was like, yeah. oh my goodness, I can't even. Yeah. Imagine any, any uncovered skin. Yeah. It, it was, it was surreal. So I don't think we'll have that again. Um, but I will tell you that my mood is a whole lot better and I have a coat for it now. So that's, <laughs> that's the thing. That's a very, very good thing because yeah, now all yeah. of a sudden it becomes a lot easier to handle that process of right. changing when you think about it. Yeah. When you're cold, that's a hard thing to do. When you're warmer, it's like, oh, well, I can handle this. This is easier. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And there will still be the joggers outside. You know, it's minus something, and there is a there are several joggers that go along the Mississippi River, and they have icicles hanging from their balaclavas where they mm-hmm. breathe. They look mm-hmm. like they look like that that octopus person from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> it's just, it is the most surreal thing, and it's like I really want to be get fit, but I don't want to get that fit. I uh, just mm, I admire their devotion so much. And they're I mean, wanting to get, right? but I don't they, want to get pneumonia. It, but but they don't. There's it's it's the most because there again their thoughts influence their experience. They are there to do their long distance running, to do their ultra marathons or whatever it is that they're doing. That's and amazing. the thought is their identity is I am a runner, and the I am a runner doesn't matter what the weather is. It's true. It's, it's so, true. so I am a Minnesotan. <sighs> <laughs> but what you're describing about runners running in all weather i mean I, i'm a walker and i get out and walking you know, even when it gets cold and snowy and so forth but i'm bundled up for it and then i see right? these guys out, out you know like half dressed running and you're right they do it every day so they're not getting sick but even so it makes me feel a whole lot smarter just seeing it. <laughs> i'll take that I'll take that. Yes. I'm out to prove that you can be glamorous and dressed for the Arctic. I, I actually had a whole Facebook thread about this. It's like, is there such a thing as glamorous Arctic wear? Um, as, <laughs> I mean, do we know of anybody that lives in the North Pole that looks stunning in what they wear? Uh, this, this is how I was playing with it. And it, and it was so fun because, you know, I, I, I'm only five foot. So when you add three or four layers, then I start looking rather like a snowball. And it's, you know, <laughs> but it is, but even that, the, the change is in my thoughts shows up in that, in that I would not have even been that playful about the scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, you change your, you to change the, what you think about something and what you, and that thing you think about changes. So it's, it's such an interesting, um, play. So so it's the way you think about yourself too, because yeah. when you're being, you can't really be playful and be glum at the same time. It doesn't really work. No, no, that's true. Or grumpy. Yeah, I've also or grumpy. Tried yeah. That. No. yeah. I mean, um, it's possible to try, but it <laughs> looks too ridiculous in some ways. And I'm just, I'm just figuring <laughs> Shirley MacLaine, I was born in a bad mood. Yeah, so, right. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's so, you know, when people have what they see as, um, intractable things, you change what you can change, and that's how you yeah. show up to stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you do, you get fed more. Mm-hmm. See, that's what I love about how the universe works, how law of attraction works, that all I have to do is take some kind of step, some you know, make some sort of shift, change a behavior, change a pattern of some kind. Buy a and coat. Buy a coat, yeah, sure. And then all of a sudden, everything shifts. <laughs> the whole experience starts to change, and I start getting mm-hmm. new input. Input that I didn't get before. It's kind of the same mm-hmm. thing as yeah. between being low vibe and high vibe. When you're low vibe, high vibe seems impossible. When you're high vibe, low vibe seems you know, well, it's too bad. I'm sorry about that. You know, it, it's not the same feeling at all. It's a completely mm-hmm. different feeling. And, and you can experience. have and you can have two people experiencing exactly the same thing in completely different ways on both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty Definitely. wild. Most Something I'm really paying attention to lately is. I've been making it a point. Now, I, I, well, I've been doing a few things. Now that we're in the gardening off season, this is the time for me to start doing other things that I've been putting off, you know, such as my daily routines, getting back into them, doing the mirror work, doing the appreciations, doing, doing all the stuff I wasn't doing before. And it's a good thing, by the way. I'm liking doing that. One of the things that goes along with that is strong recognition, like I've never had before, about how important it is for me 
to wait until I'm into a positive, high vibe frame of mind before I make a decision of any kind. I don't care if it's as small as going to the kitchen. Any decision. Put them off until I'm feeling better. If I'm not feeling better, do what it takes to feel better. Because the experience is so dramatically different. Not just the immediate one, but what follows that one and what follows that one. It, it, it cascades. It turns into a whole series of experiences. And then you think that that's how law of attraction works. All of a sudden, it starts delivering stuff that wasn't being delivered before. Mm -hmm. The mindset changed so much. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm making a big deal out of that. And it's not like I'm not having times where I'm just feeling miserable. That I, I had one today, actually. Um, interesting thing. I... I, I no, you guys both know that I have been in this Thai boot camp. I'm about ready to graduate. I'm on the last module. And one of the things that they want you to do in that last module is to set three intentions. And they can be whatever you want them to be. They kind of recommend, I, I, the way I describe it is it's like the easy one, the medium one, and the difficult one. Mm -hmm. And they recommend, you know, make one about money or weight loss or something like that. You know, just, you know, really go for it and see where you're at compared to when you started the program. So I set three intentions. My first one was super simple. It was the intention that I was going to do my um, my routine every day, which would be new. <laughs> and it was one I could reach. It didn't require a whole lot of manifesting, but, you know, I could do that. And so I've been doing that. The second one, that was my medium one. My medium one was we had four customers from the guardian service who I've been trying to collect checks from. They hadn't paid their bill yet. I've been working on them for over a month, in one case, two months. And I said, you know what? I want to manifest having all four of them pay their uh, pay their bills by next Monday. This was this past Monday. Within th within one hour, three checks showed up. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty darn okay. cool. Yeah. <laughs> now we're cooking. And then I got a phone call from the fourth one. That was the one I've been trying to reach for a couple months. And that one at first turned into a really bad situation because she, I won't go into the whole story, but the bottom line is she was playing the role of the victim. And implying that we have victimized her, but when I tried to parry down, oh no, no, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you did anything, you know. But I want you to pay for everything. <laughs> it was that kind of a mentality, and I wasn't taking that too well. But I handled the call as professionally as I could, and finally got her to commit to sending the check in, and then spent another hour meditating to calm myself down because I went right down that spiral. But used my tools to find back up. Got to a better place. Okay, moved on. Today, we got the check in the mail, right? Except that she deducted another 200 bucks that she thought she should take off. <laughs> so, one more time, down the spiral. One more time, all that kind of thing. And then I realized, you know what? That's her. That's who she is. She's in a miserable place. I'm glad I'm not in that place. I'm certainly not going to stay down in that place because I don't want to join her down there. So, I'm just going to write the rest off. Not worry about it. And I'm going to consider this a victory because, hey, I, I got the four checks, didn't I? So You did. You know, so there's the, I, I rode the roller coaster, but because I've been doing the routines, and, and item one was do the routines every day, I climbed right back out really quickly each time. So mm -hmm. I consider that to be, okay, I've got two of the three down pat. All I got to do is really the, cool. now, now, the third one's the really hard one. And I shouldn't say the hard one. It's the most aggressive one. Let's put it that way. Because that one, I, I've been playing Dan Mangana's Money Game. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, Jackie. She, he wrote a, a, an ebook called The Money Game. And the gist of the ebook is you aim to attract very small amounts of money into your life. And then as you attract a small one, you, you up the ante by a small amount. And you keep upping the ante over and over and over again. Just attracting, you know, fun money, just out of the yeah. clear sky. Blue, blue money. Blue money. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm up to the $2,500 plateau at this point. I've been through like uh, seven levels of it so far. So I figured, well, okay, I've been waiting on the 2500 level for about six months or so, something like that. So let's let's get that done, and let's make it really interesting. Let's get it done by December 15th. And if it doesn't happen, that's so what? No big deal. But I figured, you know, I, I'm going to see if I can really apply and do the journaling and all the stuff they want us to do and, you know, see how much I can actually get done for that goal of getting into that feeling place. So that that's the last thing, and then I'll be graduating the program after that but it the point of all of this is to say when i apply myself and do all these things like i, I promised myself i was going to do it follow through and get into that high vibe space those times that i fall down i don't stay there very long i bounce right back up and my whole experience really does shift my mm -hmm. whole experience changes dramatically mm -hmm. all because i just make some shifts in my thinking mm -hmm. yeah 
Choose your thoughts and your circumstances will change. They do. It's fun. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, especially when checks arrive in the mail. Oh, yes. Like <laughs> especially nowadays that we can uh, deposit the checks um, virtually. You know, you take a picture of the check. I know, can you, can you imagine, you know, I'd like explaining. I imagine my father, father-in-law was a chartered accountant and explained the fact that I could say to him, you take a picture with your phone. Well, firstly, those two phones <laughs> are together. So yeah, I think right. your phone and your check is automatically deposited into your bank account. Right. It's just like, it's sci-fi. It's so cool. We, the, the, the era we live in is just so cool. Very the mm-hmm. and, and I have to admit, I, I don't do it strictly according to Hoyle. You're supposed to destroy the checks 60 days later or something like that. But I've been keeping them throughout the season. And I've got this stack of checks that's about this big. <laughs> it's really something. I pull it out and I hold it like, whoa, oh my goodness. Look at all <laughs> we got this year. <laughs> I think I mean, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can do the ten thousand dollar game where instead of getting right. our ten thousand dollars in cash, you just throw checks up in the air and have them be planned everywhere. Maybe I'll do that before I burn them all. That'd be fun. I remember, I remember it's all money. money. It's absolutely all money. It's it's so funny. A, a client of mine, um, we were playing with what she had decided. She, she had gone a long time thinking money was very scarce. Money was over there somewhere out there and whatnot. And she decided to say, what if money, what if I'm surrounded by money? Because I was mentioning that where I am up here on the 17th floor, I can see money everywhere. There's a Four Seasons that has just been built for six and a half million dollars. And then the bridge over the Mississippi is being repaired at a vast amount. And then there's a, um, there's a realm condo building being built over there and the studio 700 square feet is one and a half million dollars oh, and that's geez. the one that's right down there by the elevator shaft you know it's just looking so um there's a lot of money around here and the more i noticed it the more my own money started to loosen up a bit and so i mentioned this to her and she decided she was surrounded by money that was how she wanted to feel surrounded by money well she started clearing out her office space and found tax returns, checks unbanked, gift cards that she hadn't used, all this stuff in the stuff that was all around her. She was literally surrounded by money. It just didn't look like money in the dollar bill sense. Right. Um, but she was. She proved herself right. She was surrounded by money. That's and it's, cool. it is a very cool story. It's it's a it's a cool thing to play with, and it's just like, okay, so how could you be surrounded by what you want? You know, this is what you want is within reach always. Otherwise, you you wouldn't be a vibrational match. So this is this is fun to play with. It also has the advantage of of being an example of. I'm thinking of the Abraham Hicks explanations about how this stuff works, that it's all in the vortex, right? It's all kind of swimming mm-hmm. around that vortex waiting to be delivered. Well, it was literally, her vortex was literally her room. Mm-hmm. It was all around the room. It was kind of, in a sense, swimming around the room, just waiting for her to let it in. Yes, it and right to there. notice it. And to notice it required a thought change, a perspective change. And so, yeah, it's it's really, we are so much more powerful um, than we than we allow ourselves to even play with. So cool. I've said that before, but I'm going to raise that as a question. Just how powerful do you think we are? If you had to like figure can... out a way to express it, how, 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 how high is up, I guess? I don't think we can, we can quantify that. I mean, um, you know, just like we were just talking now, what we're doing now would have been quantified as magic and yes. probably had us all burnt at the stake, <laughs> right, um, yes. you know, for even mentioning it. So, um, and and reality expands as we move towards it. So um, the, the future expands as we move towards it. So I don't think there is a quantifiable end game. I think, in my opinion, boredom is the end game. It's like when you can when you can manifest at the drop of a hat, and everything works out exactly as you plan, and you have nothing to navigate around or through. Everything's easy. Everything. It's like that's when you decide to come down from wherever you were and be human for a minute and see what that's like. Yeah. Because, because really, you know, part of the game of, of life is expansion and you have to 
you have to move through things to expand. True. I don't sure. think there. I don't think there's a level. I don't think it's quantifiable. I think the only betterment that we need to pay attention to is more than who we were yesterday. That's all. That's a good way to describe it mm -hmm. because that, that keeps it within perspective, makes it something that's easy to handle, easy to address. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about it a whole lot. Just, oh, just better than yesterday. Okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. no yeah. Yeah. Good. And then it stops comparisonitis and it stops all sorts of other unhelpful tendencies that we humans tend to get caught up in. What you were describing also reminds me of a key Kaya concept. They, they talk about trying to see things from source perspective. So if, if you have something that you would normally consider to be a negative, zoom backwards, so to speak, and look at it from a source perspective and see it completely differently. And you can actually get to the point where you appreciate it, where it's actually a good thing. You just that. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you just described beautifully how that happens. You get to the point where you want to go into the mess because you're just so bored with everything manifesting out of thin blue sky, you know? Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that if you're not playing a big enough game, you will screw up the one you're in just to give yourself something to do. <laughs> I think you'll, you, you'll probably do it anyway. Like, our power is so much bigger than we think. But we didn't come here, like you said, we didn't come here to be bored. We didn't no, come here and we didn't come here to be all powerful either. No, <laughs> and like, well, we talk about, like, playing games, you know? Any game that you go to play, um, it wouldn't be any fun at all if there were no challenges. Right. It has you to know, have a list and boundaries. The golf ball was 12 inches wide, you know, wouldn't really be <laughs> much fun for people. Like, we want it to be difficult, and we expect that when we're thinking of it as a game. And I think that that's what we intended when we incarnated. Like, we wanted to come do something that had some challenging aspects to it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's like, it's like people who go and climb rock faces, you know, because they're there. Or Just jog in fifty mile weather. <laughs> That's right. Know, yeah. climb, hang from their fingernails at five hundred feet above the ground. Is, is yeah. that okay? All right. I'll choose some other challenges. <laughs> yeah, horse. That's fine. Yeah, it's it is it is such an interesting thing. I I do think that um, I think we forget to remember how powerful we are. Mm -hmm. but, but that rule of, of the, the golf course, the, the golf cup being, you know, a couple feet wide or something, like changes the whole game because now it becomes, what do you mean you didn't get a hole in one? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I always think that, that they, they should have raised the basketball post by now. Because yeah, you know, the, the players are so much taller. Exactly. Yeah. When you've got somebody who's nine foot tall and he's doing a slam dunk, it's like, what kind of a challenge is that? It, it's like, if I was playing basketball now, there's a game, right? Because it's like, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that's not a thing. You, you get a whole bevy of people at five foot tall, now that's a game. You could probably make a loop around that one. That would, that would actually gain, you know, television interest, I would think. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it is, it's an interesting, you know, and when we play with just how powerful we might be, um, it, it, I think it loosens up our perspective again. We, we entertain different thoughts. And when we entertain different thoughts, we get different experiences. Completely different thoughts. And, and I like that idea of playing with that because there's so many things we play with that actually end up being against our own best interest. And we're just like, we're, we're tripping our, over our own feet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But when we play that kind of game where we're trying to stretch the imagination, how far can I go? How, how, how much can I accomplish and so forth? It's an entirely different feeling. It's an entirely different experience that follows the feeling. It's an entirely different thought process. It's amazingly mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very exciting too. Um, something else I want to ask you guys too, because this is kind of like, you know, leading off of the question, well, how big is, how high is up? You know, how much the power is and so mm -hmm. forth. How, how low is the power? How, 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 how low can somebody go in terms of being a victim, for instance? I mean, how, how, how bad can you make it for yourself? Because we dive into this contrast, right? And, and I get the feeling there are some people, they just, they actually come here to just dive as deep as they can go. Yeah. So I agree with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Pretty deep. And that energy of victim energy, which we've all experienced, um, it's very, very heavy for the amount of energy that it is. So we all have the same amount of energy. It's just divvied up 
with different levels, right? We may have a lot of energy that's that victim energy or conflict energy. We may have a lot of energy that's creative energy, which is much higher on the energy spectrum. Um, but it only takes a little bit of that lower level of energy to really bring everything down. Which is why when you're speaking to someone that's there, <laughs> mm. it's easier for you to come away feeling bad or, you know, feeling uncomfortable, um, feeling brought down than it is for them to come away feeling lifted up. It's because that energy is like so powerful that that really, you know, level one energy, level two energy, very, very heavy and powerful. It doesn't take much of it. So think about a room full of people and everybody's having a good time. It's a party atmosphere going on. And one person shows up that's like really not in that same energy level. It can bring the whole room to a halt, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. You have a whole yeah. room of people and everyone's complaining and everyone's upset and everyone's, you know, in a victim mode. And one person comes in that's up. It's not as easy to lift all of that up because it's very heavy energy. So I think, and when you're down there in that really low place, it's very hard to see your way out. Um, as coaches, I mean, I know I've been down there, but as coaches, I know also that when you're speaking with someone who's way down in that level of energy, they will most likely be arguing for their limitations with everything they've got. And every time, you know, if, if you go the route of trying to convince them otherwise, which is not the right route to go, um, you'll often get, but, but, yeah, but, but, no, that won't work. No, no, because they're really invested. But it's because that energy is so heavy and it's so hard to see the way out. So I think in answer to your question, like how low can we go? It's pretty low. <laughs> pretty low. <laughs> pretty low. Yeah. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, that experience – um, you know, I don't want to be there. I, it's not a place I like to be. I've told this story before. When I was going through my divorce, what I recognized is that anyone I told would immediately say, oh, my gosh, that's so terrible. I'm so sorry. Like, that was the response. Now, of course, their intention was just to be to show me support, to show me they cared about me. But the effect was that I immediately went into victim mode. I was just like, oh poor me, just you know, they were pouring poor me all over me. Right. So I was just like, Oh, so I, I know I was out with a friend one time and we ran into a mutual friend. We hadn't seen in a long time. And they said, Oh, how are you? And they said, how are you doing? I said, great. And he said, you know, they asked me how my husband and my kids were. And I said, they're doing great. And, uh, you know, it was a two minute conversation in the middle of a shopping mall and where the ones where everybody says we should go have coffee sometime. Yeah, we should. And then, you know, you're never going to see them again for another five years. Right. And when we walked, <laughs> when we walked away, my friend said, why didn't you tell, why didn't you say that you were getting a divorce? Like you just completely, you know, and I said, because I realized that, you know, this is not someone I'm going to see all the time. And as soon as I say I'm going through a divorce, they start saying, oh, my gosh, that's so terrible. I'm so sorry. And it just brings me so all of a sudden I'm in that, oh, my gosh, this is awful what I'm going through. Right. But I wasn't really feeling that way until I got around that energy that was like. And so I just stopped saying it to people because it didn't put me in a good place. There was no need to say it. I didn't lie to them impression. and say, oh, you know, go on and on about how great everything was. But I just didn't bring it up. But, but so, that raises a really good question, though, because there are going to be times when any of us run into somebody that we know, presumably somebody we care about, who is going through something to let us know about it. What's a good way to respond to something like that? Well, How do we I tell that? you, you know what? At some point, um, I was talking to somebody, and for whatever reason, it was the right time for me to say, oh, we're not together anymore. We, we've just finalized our divorce. And she said, congratulations. Good for you. And it kind of like shocked me because that's not how anybody ever responded. But you know what? It was, it was like so uplifting because I was entering a new part of my life where things were much, much better, right? People don't get a divorce because they think that after the divorce, things will be worse. No. <laughs> and Very so, true. and this person had been through a divorce. So like she understood that, oh, this is a new, new level for you. Like this is a new part of your life. Things are going to be better. So she said, that's wonderful. Congratulations. I hope, I hope you're doing great. And it, 
good answer. That was much better. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that that's the thing you should say to anyone who's going through something hard. You know, it's probably not appropriate a lot of the time. But I just recognized in myself that that's, I didn't want to be in victim mode. So, you know, I just decided to not, not take an action that I knew was probably going to result in me being thrown into the victim hole, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it makes so much sense. And the thing is that you were aware of how those responses made you feel, and so you stepped away from those responses, right? Um, because there's no point, you know, if you've got a bruise, there's no point inviting people to lean on it all the time. Right? So, that's you know, um, yeah. but it is also... Uh, when you do have somebody that's in, so the first piece that I want to say here, and I want to put a caveat, just in case somebody takes being in a bad place as something you chose. There is a lot of people out there that say we choose that. And if that makes you feel empowered, then it's a good thought. If it doesn't, don't, don't entertain it do what you can to make yourself feel better if that's not your feeling better thought don't go there don't agree with people who say oh you must have attracted this well no shit Sherlock I got it um so you know it is it is (laughs) yeah exactly so um and and it's very gaslighting to say that uh, if somebody's in a really bad place, oh, what did you do to attract this? You know, um, because they're not there at that point yet. How can I be? How can I help you? How can I? Yeah. How are you feeling about this? Um, what What is your What is your experience now? How are you doing now um, after all this thing? So somebody will say, "I'm getting a divorce," and if I had met Cindy, I would have said something along the lines of. And how are you doing now? Bringing her into present time to say, well, actually, I'm really doing well. I'm so glad that I did this. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad, blah, 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 right? I've got all these right. adventures happening. Um, and, you know, I, I had a somebody that I hadn't seen for a while, and she had been very badly hit during the um, – she had a – the pandemic was a bad experience for her because it isolated her so badly, and she – she ended up feeling um, in a depressive episode. And, you know, when she told me about this, I could hear, I could hear the, the, I could hear the pain in her voice. And it was, so asking her, and how are you now? Brings her to this moment. She said, actually, I'm feeling kind of optimistic. You know, I'm able to mm-hmm. get out. Of this. Whereas if I'd gone, Oh no, you, that sucks. Right. You know, it's like, um, I would have put her back in that spot. So mm-hmm. I'm really careful to say, and this is just the way I work is to, to be clear about which version of you I'm talking to. I can't right. do anything about that version. I am not a therapist. That's their domain. They can help heal mm-hmm. your past. I want to know how I can help your present. So I'm very careful to say, what do you need now? Who are you now? How are you now? And move from there. There was a point where, you know, I was always very self-sufficient. And Mm -hmm. so I didn't often reach out for help. Yes. And at some point in the beginning of it, I knew that I needed to reach out for help because I need, I kind of needed someone to say, Oh, that sucks. I'm so sorry. Right. Right. And at that point I did reach out to family and friends that I knew would support me, that I knew would commiserate with me a little bit. Right. You know, get on my level. And then I knew could lift me up. So, you know, it, it all just depends on what you're needing. Like you said, Jackie, that's a really nice way to say it. Um, How are you feeling now? What's going on for your now? Like, always bring it into the present. And so that was a way because we we do go through things in life where we are riding that wave where, Mm -hmm. you know, like I love that you said, you asked that question and the person said, well, we're actually, right. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I'm kind of feeling optimistic. So it's like when, when we go through anything, we will experience all those different levels of energy. So we will be down in there and we will come up and like being aware of that for our own self gives us the power. It's a place where we can be empowered to ask for what we need 
and Mm -hmm. to orchestrate things in a way where we're going to get what we need. Like I knew at that other place where I was actually feeling really empowered, but I was still kind of fragile and I knew what I needed. Mm -hmm. I needed to stay at that level on that vibe in that place where I knew what I was doing was right, where I was feeling empowered and having someone all of a sudden saying, poor you wasn't going to keep me there. So I made that choice. But there was other time where I made the other choice where it's like, I really need some support. I am feeling about as low as a person can be. And I need someone to see that and witness it and let me know that you're there for me. So knowing what you need and being aware of everything you're feeling without judgment, you know, mm-hmm. right. Without yes. judging it. Um, it's so, it's so, so important. And it's a place of empowerment for us when we can be aware of that and know what's going to support us best. Mm-hmm. It's nice yep. to know also that we can actually help somebody by not trying to help them by simply asking that question. How are you doing <laughs> yeah. right now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, because when we rush to fix or rush to help, we are assuming that we know what they need and we don't yeah. yet. Right. Right. We really don't. And so with the information, we still may not know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so giving them a chance to wrap some words around what they might need. Um, I remember when my mm. my second baby arrived and I had a two year old. And I don't think I've ever been that tired in my entire life. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And so because they said, oh, a newborn is so hard. Well, the first one's fine because you can sleep when the baby sleeps. But the Mm. two year old doesn't give a damn about that. And um, and I was I was outside in the yard with the small one in my arms and the two year old running around like a headless chicken. And I, um, and my neighbor popped over and she said, oh, the new one's arrived. And I went, yes. (laughs) <laughs> this and is not a she, said, she looked at me and she said how about i sit out here with them for half an hour and you go nap Aww. it's like oh my god can i make you a saint like i'm just yeah. having some yeah. yeah. that i can write this minute because she had been there she had three she knew what it was like and she was smart enough to suss out from my energy levels that really what i needed was some time to sleep and that's all i did i went inside I slept for 20 minutes and I came back outside and everybody was fine and I didn't want to like slaughter the world. So it was, it it was so, you know, we, we can assume and we can step into help. We always should offer to help, but we also don't have to assume that we know we can give the person a chance to ask. Um, And if they can't ask, then do what feels pragmatic and, and useful. Part so, of that that's that's funny. I didn't know your kids were two years apart. My kids are 20 years <laughs> apart. Somewhere there's yeah. a picture of me with the second one in my arms, laying in my arms, and I'm, I've got the most giant cup of coffee you've ever seen in your life, and I'm looking at the camera, and I have these huge circles under my eyes. I don't think I've slept for like two years. <laughs> So no, I know, right? It's just like, yeah, they, they always say, you know, people will say, oh, the first baby is so hard. It's like, no, no, the second one. The second one is, and the, and if you happen to have a third, but the second one after that is, is definitely. And that's where, you know, um, I wanted to address this thing about being stuck. Uh, I am always talking about seasons with my clients. We go through seasons as humans. We go mm-hmm. through a mothering season. We go through a dating season. We go through an empty nesting season. We go through finding a job season or school season or whatever it is. Um, and some of the seasons are really, really hard. But when we think we're stuck there, when we say I'm stuck, we add a brain's opinion to something that we actually want to shift, but we're, we're arguing for it to stay the same. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, it's like people are so careful. I'm thrilled people are so careful about diagnoses um, these days. Not I am this, but I yeah. have a diagnosis of, right? And so when I say, and I hugely um, was was tied into this, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm confused. I used to use use this phrase a lot. And then it's like, what if this is just a season? What if this is a lull? What does, what would it look like then? If I had a season of stuckness, it could be a hibernation. 
It could yes. be cocooning, right? It could be mm-hmm. any of these things. Um, but labeling, the way we label things, uh, right from my very beginning, I, I knew the power of labels. I started calling myself the goddess of lattes at the coffee shop because it made me feel less like a drone, right? And less, it just, I, it was just a, a huge thing for me to play with and lighten this, this stuckness that I felt I was in because I was having to do retail to pay off a credit card debt that I'd got myself into. And um, so when I started talking about, and I was, it was flippant first, it was just playing. I am the goddess of lattes. And one of my regular clients went, oh, yeah, you are. I was like, oh, if one person thinks I am, then obviously it's true. So <laughs> I uh, I started dressing up and I was all Chanel beads and fancy hair and all the things. And I was the best dressed barista you ever did see. And very soon I just got to be called goddess. You know, it's like people would call me goddess and then it would turn up in odd places like, I'd get cut off in traffic. Well, how would the goddess behave like this? How would goddess Jackie show up for this, you know? Um, and so then I, you know, so I blow the man kisses instead of giving him the middle finger, which made him nearly swerve into a ditch, I want to say. It was a beautiful piece of karma. Um, but it, it was, you know, it, it changed the label that I chose for myself changed everything and it's part of role creation it's like cindy you know she's got she her mad magician and she her goddess and it's it is these these labels that we choose for ourselves can unstick you from the ones you feel you've been lumped with shall we say this is why i love so much the idea of of the little language tweak of saying i feel right i feel stuck i feel confused instead of i am Yes. Agreed. Right. Because when we say I, those two words are very powerful. And when we say I am, even for any emotion, right? I am angry. I am sad instead of I feel angry because I'm so much more than stuck or angry or confused or sad or even happy. Right. It's like, I like to feel those things. I like to say I feel those things instead of I am. And that goes back to your, you know, uh, labeling right we Mm -hmm. label things and then we take it on like you were talking about diagnosis right someone saying i have whatever and Mm -hmm. and it's so it solidifies it i think sometimes instead of just recognizing that we all experience things and we can experience the feeling of being stuck and i like your reframe too right it's like uh, well, but what if this was exactly, and I say this a lot because it's one of my favorite affirmations. It was Louise Hay. I'm in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when we say, oh, I'm so stuck, there's also this judgment around it that I'm in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't feel this way. I'm stuck instead of, wait, okay, I'm feeling a little stuck, but I know that I'm in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So how does it feel to think that this is actually right? Like everything's working right. And I'm in the part of the process where it feels sticky, but it's, it's a season and it's going to change and things are going Mm -hmm. to be different. I think it's so much, I don't know. It's a different vibe, right? To look at it that way, to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it unhooks our attention on, on what isn't working. I must admit, I find the, the right place, right time. When you're having a really crappy experience, that is a hard stretch. Um, uh, it has it been always for me. helps me no matter okay. what and that and and and, it, and I'm sure it helps a lot of people out there but for me it didn't it was too too far it was like going you know from from minus something to way further I said it's the same thing as people talking about their future selves they need to talk about their next future selves so for and I'll just offer this that instead of the right place at the right time I would say something like what if this turns out better than expected? Mm-hmm. Better than expected is my favorite unsticking tool because I'm expecting the worst and I'm expecting to stay here forever, <laughs> right? This is what stuckness feels like. It and does. then so to say, okay, so I'm feeling stuck, but what if this turns out better than expected? Well, I'm expecting this ghastly scenario. So what, what might, what might not be as bad as that? And then I can inch myself into thinking, 
okay, this is a season. Right now, this is how I feel. It's not to say that's how I'm going to feel in the morning. Yeah. Interesting and then move on that. from there. Interesting you're saying that because I'm kind of thinking back to times where I have felt that stuckness. I've even talked about it here on the program many times. And when you're in that spot, I know the first thing that I, I, I recognize, okay, I don't want to use language that's going to reinforce the stuckness, but then I kind of stumble when I'm in that place because well, I can't think of another way to describe it. How am I supposed <laughs> to describe this thing I'm in? <laughs> so that's right. the first thing that happens. But then once I get past that, that little bit of language dialogue, then the next thing that happens is, all right, well, Oh, do I, what, what is it that I want to feel differently? And I don't know. And then mm. the only thing that comes to my mind is, well, I want to feel better. Yep. What would feel better? That's the question, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would feel better? Mm. Mm. And, and, even then, and, and this is where actually differentiation starts to happen because there's a part of me that says, yes, I want to feel better. And the other part of me that says, I don't dare do that. Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm seeing the two things going on there. I'm seeing the one direction toward improvement and the other direction of staying right where I am because that's where I feel comfortable right now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that lizard brain that never wants to change. Or... Yeah, <laughs> and right. this is why we need coaches. Can I just mention that? So I... Absolutely. <laughs> yes. This, this is, is what coaching is true. for, <laughs> is to help you untangle those pieces where your brain is trying so hard to keep you safe. And the brain doesn't give a damn about how you feel. It just wants you breathing and preferably mm. vertical, but that's also an option. So <laughs> it, <laughs> it really is. It just wants you safe. And then, but, but betterment is growth. Change is growth is change and change is inherently risky and your brain doesn't like risk. So it would rather you stay stuck and believing in the stuckness than consider a change. Yep. And so that's the piece that we have to unravel. And that's what coaches, good coaches, are skilled at helping you see. And there is something in here also that's kind of an interesting thing. And that is, you can be in that place of stuckness. Whether or not you're talking to a coach, you can recognize the advantage of climbing out. And on the other hand, recognize the advantage of staying where you are. And in that confusion, you can talk yourself out of a change. Mm -hmm. And so you many people do. Out of it entirely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, we have tools and, for that. <laughs> yes. This is true. But that's, that's because your brain will default to the the less change option. Or mm -hmm. it will it, it knows how to do you as you are. It it knows how you to be somebody stuck because it's been stuck for a while, right? It knows how to do that. So it's not sure how to be somebody who's unsticking themselves. So it will drag you back to its familiar point. Um, and so, yeah, it does take, it, it takes application, not always effort, but it does take application. It does take some attention. It takes some time and it takes some loving kindness um, with yourself and judgment free so that you can work out where this tangle is and unknot it for yourself. The place we often refer to as our comfort zone is usually not comfortable at all. Mm -hmm. I, I like to refer to it more as the familiar zone because that's what we're really going for is what's familiar. That's why we stay in crappy relationships, crappy jobs, because that part of our brain that we're talking about it is certain we can survive those things because we survived it yesterday or for a month or for a year or for 10 years. Exactly. And it doesn't know if we can survive this new thing, being single or being with someone else or being with a new job. It doesn't know because it's uncertain. We've never done that before. It's always going to go for the certainty, the certain part that feels safe, but it's usually not the comfort place. We always say, oh, we want to stay in our comfort zone, but it's just, the familiar zone, I think, is a better name for it, right? Mm -hmm. And I what just want to finish off by saying that we talk about being in flow. I don't think uh, it's really important to realize that being in flow is not always comfortable. True. Sometimes no. we can be in our flow and our zone and we're creating and it all feels kind of tingly and a little bit scary and exhilarating okay. and we're not sure right we're uncertain we're dancing on a new stage and and um but that's that's the that's the happy place that's a really good spot where where we're 
uncomfortably flowing. And that is, that is so cool because that's where you know you're being pulled into your change as opposed to like striving towards it. By the way, we have a question in the live stream from uh, somebody who's become something of a regular listener. His name's Gregory, and I think it's a, it's aimed at you, Cindy, so I'll, I'll bring it to you. How do I cast spells on my neighbors to make them believe I'm the descendant of Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> Best Wait. question ever. Wait, okay, read, read that again. Okay, I'll put it up on screen, too, so you can see it. He says, how do I cast spells on my neighbors to make them believe I'm the descendant of Michael Jackson? <laughs> well, you know. I would ask you why that's important to you. Um, I, I, I rather do the kind of magic that casts spells on yourself to help you believe that it doesn't matter who you're a descendant of, right? Um, because that's the kind of magic that you can really control instead of trying to make other people uh, believe things that's not really all that important. So I would say, why is it important to you to make your neighbors believe that you're anything? Um, what's important is that you believe <laughs> in who you are and in the power that you have. And that doesn't really um, have anything to do with who you are or are not a descendant of. <laughs> Which is a good thing, actually. <laughs> yes, yes. But that, yeah, that was an interesting one because I mean I know that the way you think about magic is is quite different. When I saw that one, I said, "Okay, this is going to be fun." <laughs> well, I think that all that every word is a spell. Um, I also think that spells and prayers and blessings and you know, there's a whole list of words that can all just mean the same thing, right? But our words are really powerful, so um, we should be, you know, Florence Scovelshin, one of my favorite old timey New Thought teachers. Uh, said one time that if we really realized how powerful our words were, we would be much more careful with how we use them and with the things that we say. And so I think all of our words are spells. And what if we walked through a day like tomorrow with that idea that everything I utter today is a spell and not just a spell, but a very powerful spell that is going to have results. Um, how would we navigate our words you know. We certainly wouldn't say things like, I am stuck. Right. <laughs> right? Yes, yes, exactly. Right. And we come so, full circle. I love it when that happens. I yes. <laughs> but you reminded me of something, Jackie, that I haven't done in a while. I'm going to have you guys do it here. And that is tell people, you're both life coaches. How do they find you? I mean, we, if now that we put out there that you want to talk to a life coach, we got to tell them how to find the life coach. <laughs> well, you can email me at Jacqueline at JacquelineGates.com. Uh, super easy. Otherwise, I'm on Facebook, uh, and I would love to see you there, too. So that would be fabulous. Yes, same here. Uh, Cindy Chavez, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z. You can reach out to me um, through my website. Um, I don't know, Walt, about our uh, LOA Today app yet, but when the app is running, you can reach out to me there. But you can definitely just email me, Cindy at CindyChavez.com. I would love to hear from you. Yes, me too. I would love to hear from you too. By the way, we love also taking some of those emails and turning them into shows sometimes. sometimes yeah, we yeah we've done it lots of times. People have yeah. emailed us with a certain situation or whatever, and we've done a whole show on it. So, and it's fun. Yes. In fact, I've even gotten co-hosts that way. You have? I'm serious. Three of my co-hosts right now, four of them are ex-listeners. And I think every single one of them at one point sent in a question, which is pretty cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Look that how that translated cool. over time. It turned into, well, I want to be a part of the show. Yes. Hey. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Good stuff. All right. Hey, well, for, you know, for three people who didn't have a topic, we did pretty good today. <laughs> <laughs> we always do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you guys very much. Thank you for the interesting question from the live stream. That was cool. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>